Plan B on the A-frame is the uh, sticks we're going to use to push up the top because I realized that we're going to run out of ladder before we run out of A-frame. Chapel's almost done. Uh, they got to weigh about 150 pounds of peat. We got there is the EcoFlow pack power in the entire cabin now. This video is sponsored by EcoFlow Delta Max. This is my go-to battery when I need to power my off-grid projects. I personally recommend it. It has all of the features that you would want in a battery pack and more. What I especially like about the EcoFlow Delta Max is that it's got two handles. You can carry it close to your body so it doesn't hurt your back. The other features on this thing is it's got six AC ports so you can plug in all your tools, your battery chargers, the power goes out, you can plug in your fridge or your, uh, your kettle or anything that you need to power off grid. On the front, you've got USB ports, USB-C, so power your high drain electronic devices such as your iPads or your iPhones or even your you know Android phone. It also has a display on the front which allows you to see your usage real time. It'll allow you to kind of budget your power accordingly. So if you're using your chainsaw, it'll tell you you can run it for two hours before it kills your battery. The other thing about the EcoFlow Delta Max, it's scalable. You can add additional battery packs up to six kilowatts of power. This pack has the ability to be charged in three ways. You can either plug it into your car through a DC port, you can plug it into your house, which is AC, or you can hook it up to solar. This is the business end of the EcoFlow Delta. So it has the ports that you can AC adapt it to your house, or it's got the solar adapter over here. This is your cigarette lighter adapter, which allows you to charge it with your car. The cool thing about this is you can do dual charge. So if you really want it to charge fast, you can plug it into your house and you can have your solar panels up to 800 watts. With the PureSign inverter, this allows you to plug in six devices simultaneously, two cooling fans on the back so your inverter never overheats. Over on this side of the pack, we have USB-A. We have four ports and then two USB-C ports, which allows you to fast charging of your high drain mobile devices. So over here on our control panel, if you click the button, it turns it on and it displays how much your pack is charged. So here I got 100%, I got 99 hours, of usage, which is pretty much infinite if you uh, just leave it sit there. This thing actually boasts a one year shelf life. So once you charge it up, you can actually sit it on the shelf. So it's ready for you to use in the event your power goes out. The EcoFlow Delta Max has one of the fastest charging times on the market. It has a zero to 80% charge in 65 minutes. EcoFlow has really thought of everything when they designed this pack. What's really cool about it is if you have an additional pack, they stack on top of each other. So they've got this little indent thing and then you can stack them vertically so you don't take up as much cupboard space or counter space. So maybe you're not working the off grid like I am. Maybe you just, you know, you're sitting at home and you're worried about the grid. This thing is the ideal solution for that. You kind of power it up, you charge it up, you put it in your, you know, your, your, your closet. And then when the power goes out, you got power and your neighbors are left in the dark. Of all the packs I've ever used, the EcoFlow Delta is my go-to, honest to goodness, great pack. I highly recommend it. So if you guys want to pick yourself up one, the link will be in the description below. Now let's get back to work. Yeah. The pioneers used to ride these for miles. This is my big log. Another fine day at the off-grid. And today, we've got a special project we're building. We've been spending the last couple of weeks organizing and gathering materials. We're going to be doing an A-frame. Not, 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 not just a special A-frame, like a Canadian A. A, A-frame, right there. We've got the remnant of a fire hall garage doors. Look at these things. Look at those, those are, those are crazy. 35 and a half inches wide by about 12 feet long. And that's going to be the predominant structure of the A-frame. So it's gonna be very futuristic. I got a fair size log chalked up on the mill. It's a spruce log. We actually salvaged from a tree job that happened in the city. So my buddy, my arborist friend, Joe over at JL's Tree Service, he was the one that said, hey, he wants some logs. What we're gonna do with this guy is we're gonna make it into floorboards for our A-frame. I think I'll probably be able to get the entire floor and if not some other sort of boards from this guy. It is a substantial log. And anytime I'm dealing with a substantial log like this, well, it's a lot of work. Anytime you have a manual mill, cause there's a lot of, you gotta use the cant to roll it and stuff. So it's heavy, it is what it is. You gotta, you gotta get it done. It's better than buying them. So Don, what do you think of this plan? Uh, it's a good plan. Is it a good as, plan? As always, yeah. I believe it is, anyways. All right. We'll, we'll soon find out.
But it looks like we got the area pretty much cleared up. We got that dead tree cut down. We got that somewhat live cedar tree that we're gonna cut down. We're gonna actually use for post, support our structure. Got a question for you, Don. Is it easier moving brush or is it easier running the saw? It's hard to say really. Cause sometimes you have to move brush to use the saw, right? That's insightful. Oh yeah, how far are you down? Good three, four inches. Might be deep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we got almost our holes, almost all dug. You don't know this, but Don's part groundhog got the majority of his four holes dug. I, I'm, I'm behind. I had to move a hole. It's it's really it's really hard to move a hole. <laughs> it's like digging a new hole. It's worse than digging a new hole. Nah, you got to kind of like get it started. All right, now that we have our posts in place, we're just uh, backfilling them with the stuff that we took out of the hole, so the clay and the rocks and whatnot, and we're ensuring that our posts are plumb up and down and in line with the other ones. And uh, we made sure before we, we, we set our height on our posts that the far posts are sitting up out of the ground because we want the far posts to be above grade in case there's splashback from rain and whatnot running you know, off the roof. We don't want it to come up and under hit our understructure of the, uh, the building. We get a lot of flack sometimes for not using a tractor to dig our holes. And if I had an auger, I'd probably use an auger. Ideally, I want a really tight hole because when I put my post in the hole, I want it to be tight. Because when I backfill it, I got to pound all the dirt in there to make it so she's tight in there. And if you see this little post here, she's not wiggling at all. She's tight. Well, she's wiggling a little bit, but that'll dry up. And the clay will just, I don't know, it'll secure itself to the post. The post won't wiggle. There's eight posts. You're not toppling this thing over. That's a good looking post. How's that for progress? We've got all our wood down here and uh, all we gotta do now is straighten it up because it came right off the sawmill. It was a virgin spruce tree. The ends are a little jagged, so we're just gonna straighten them up with the old Makita skill saw. I got Don, he's just marking the ends on each one. So we'll straighten them and then determine how long our max length is. And that's gonna be the size of the cabin. You know, I have a plan, it's up here. It'll all work out in the end. I think it's roughly about nine feet across and uh, however wide the garage door panels are. So when I'm framing a floor, I like to lay out both ringers together and then I use my speed square and I mark out 16 inch on center on both of them at the same time. And then what I can do is I can take these, split them apart and it allows me to place my joists without even thinking about it because both plates are gonna be exactly the same. Well, how's that for a dance floor? We've got all our joists in place now all we have to do is somewhat square it up. We're having a little bit of difficulty with squaring it because it's such a big thing and everything's heavy and yeah, there's lots of lots of problems with squaring it up. So my plan is to take a sheet of plywood. Yes, plywood. Plywood and OSB have somewhat met in the middle and they're the same price now or pretty darn close. It makes no sense to use OSB. I've switched to plywood. It's like one of those aha moments where you got the sun right behind you and you figured something out at the end of the day and everything works out perfect. This is exciting. Are you guys excited? I'm excited. This is pretty cool. Oh. There we go. One more. Are you excited that thing's square? Absolutely. He's like, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna burn things. You gotta get a nice fire going. Good fire. All right, bring you guys quickly up to speed. So we've added a couple sheets of plywood already just to keep it square. And then we've squared it on its foundation pad and uh, our foundation posts. And uh, we seem to be okay. We didn't, uh, I think I just figured out why this corner wasn't moving down. I screwed it in. Yeet. It's, uh, yeah, we pulled we pulled a uh, six inch screw out the side of it. There it is right there. That's That's why that wasn't moving very well. Oh well, I guess it's moving now. In position now, all we gotta do is secure it to the base and uh, it'll stay there forever, I hope. I don't think I'm gonna put blocking in. I might put blocking in. I don't know, I'm still on the fence whether or not I should put blocking in. I understand the reason behind blocking, it prevents it from twisting the joists. Maybe I'll put blocking in. I won't bore you with those details. I will put blocking in and then I will sheet it and uh, we we'll get our, we we'll get our, start getting our A-frame up and running. We, we've been, 
clear in the area of all the deadfall. I think like a little tornado went here through here many years ago and everything kind of blew this way. And so what we're doing is we're slowly kind of cleaning up. As we've got a lull in the activity. We just kind of grab some wood and we throw it on the fire. I happened to find a nest of hornets and uh, got stung about eight times in the leg. So I stopped doing that. That's when you know you should probably stop cutting in the bush is when the hornets tell you to stop cutting wood. I've created a jig and I've laid it out on the platform itself and I've given myself some blocks that are going to hold my live edge timbers in place because I want to be able to recreate this thing well eight times. I need eight different cuts to make four different A structures or trusses in order to hold my A frame in place. And I, the last thing I wanted to do is some twisting because I'm going to be using a chainsaw. So I'm going to cut tops, bottoms, get my angle right. I figured out exactly how long my panels are. So that should work okay. Bigger's always better. Got the old Makita plug-in. Doesn't even, doesn't even. It seems like it starts up quicker than, you know, plugging it into your wall. Well, kids, doesn't look like you're going to college. I bought some structural screws. These are uh, GRK screws, I believe. And they're expensive. The, like, like, I think this was like $5 for this, for the one screw. And I'm using it to attach my A-frame structural components together. They seem to be working they're doing the job. They've got like a hex screw head on the thing. Nice, doesn't strip out. I can screw them in relatively easy. The only problem is, is they're expensive. Really, really expensive. Structural strength test, take one. Oh. It's pretty strong. Those $5 screws are really holding up. Is that brand? I lost my glass. That's strong enough. I was able to figure out the height of the frame based on the height of the panels and then I lined it up on the floor here and I drew up my line so that tells me where my peak is and it also shows me my angle and then I lined it up the back or the front of the cabin and then that allows me to actually cut it off straight so when it stands up it's sitting flat on the floor. I'm pretty proud of my jig. It's sad to take it down actually. So anyways that's the way if you want to recreate rafters and to have them bang on with a normally shaped wood because this is actually a, a squared off or flattened tree as you guys can see flattened tree it's got the one side flat it's got the other side flat and then there's a live edge on both sides so if you want to make something with live edge stuff you got to make yourself a jig take two like a monkey we've got our a-frame all set up we've got our posts in the ground which is our foundation and we've got our main beam and then we've got our ringer and our floor joists and we've got our plywood on top and as you can see we've got our a-frame up as you can see it's pretty substantial you walk right down the middle of it that's pretty cool okay so what we're going to clad with this guy is uh is we're going to clad it with garage doors and they're all made of glass they're from a, a fire hall that decided to upgrade its its garage door so the glass there's five garage doors in total that's enough to do the entire outside skin of this building so they got a kind of a blue tint to them the original plan with them was to actually make a greenhouse but uh then i realized that hey it's probably got a uv tint on it and none of the none of the uv which plants crave will get into the greenhouse so instead i've decided to make myself an a-frame cabin with these things now i guess the only problem is is that the sheer height the sheer weight of them they're extremely heavy uh not to mention they're they're glass so they're they're somewhat fragile so i'll have to hoist them up onto the a-frame but i think this is going to be the coolest looking thing ever like that's cool i don't know if you guys if i can portray how cool this thing is going to be it's going to be a you know a futuristic looking a-frame in the forest the plan with the garage door panels is to sit them on the outside structure and then having there's a stiffener rod that goes on the garage door panel so it makes it so it doesn't flex and that's going to sit down here kind of like on its ledge and then the panels get stacked up like you would a garage door all the way to the peak and then there'll be a ridge cap of some kind that I haven't even quite designed yet maybe my welder guy will fabricate me something kind of like a little 
a little hat for the top to prevent leaking down the ridge. I have a couple spares, but I don't want to start replacing glass. We, we managed to get them down here, the long trek into the forest without breaking them. So I think they're relatively durable. They were a door. They did go up and down for probably, you know, 10 years or whatever. How many, don't even know how old they are. So this is where the knee wall would go. It would go right here. Knee wall, be able to stand right at the edge. Still hunched like this. No knee wall. The closest I could stand standing up is near the middle of the building, right about here. Because ultimately the plan for this guy is to have the, the front door entrance here and then, you know, have sort of a, uh, a sleeping area over here. It's going to be like a home office type thing. There's going to be no kitchen per se in here. So there'll be a sleeping area, kind of like a wood stove. I got a plan for a wood stove over here to, to heat it. And then it's going out the back wall, not up through the roof because again, it's glass. And then... Uh, Kind of like a sitting area. So what I've decided to do is do a 39 inch knee wall, actually 39 and a half. And that'll allow me to incorporate the bottom part of this guy to give me a little bit more structural integrity on the wall. So 39 inches above that. And then this is about eight and a half. So that'll give me 48 inch tall knee wall from the bottom of this thing all the way to the top. Just like that, we got a knee wall. So this stuff I ended up uh, saving old scrap skid wood. So it's two by four skid wood. You can see kind of it's got the groove cut in it and that was uh i think they were transporting like pole logs or like utility poles and they put the strap between that thing to hold it on so that's what those are so they're not exactly the perfect two by four but for the price you just can't beat it so i find the easiest way to frame a wall is to take your top and bottom plate measure and cut them to size and then take your tape measure and run along the top and bottom plate measure your 16 inches on center mark those out with your speed square and then cut all your studs the exact same length and insert them into the wall. Either screw them together or nail them together. And then all you have to do is stand your wall up and you have yourself a wall. And just like that, we've got an e-wall. We just got to put a little bit more wood on top. We're going to do a double top plate in order to lock in the corners because otherwise they might pull apart. Right now there's only, um, it's only locked in just right at the very end. So what we're going to do is we're going to lap them over and then that'll lock the corners in. And then when we do our plywood, we're gonna lap them over again, further increasing our strength in our walls. Cause the last thing we want to do is go Bling. Normally when you'd be building an A-frame cabin, you would either use steel roofing or shingle materials. And, and that would be your, your roofing structure. But since I have all these panels, I kind of had to design the cabin around them. So I made sure it was the same length and the same height as the panels that I had. Cause I don't have any extras. And uh, they have to be pretty precise because it is a glass and aluminum frame. There's no real wiggle room when you're dealing with that sort of thing. Using these glass panels possibly saved me thousands of dollars in material because I don't have to worry about the actual cladding on the roof. So I don't have to spend any money on shingles. I don't have to spend my money on steel roof. So it's a great solution and it keeps stuff out of the landfill after all. So as you can see, we're up about 40 inches, which is slightly above countertop height if you're uh, if you're talking about kitchens wise and i think once once we got that once we got up to this height we put our a-frame above us it'll give us a lot more usable space i think i'll be able to be about here before my head touches the ceiling what do you think don you're looking forward to lifting those things up oh, absolutely tomorrow yeah tomorrow. tomorrow you want to do it tonight come yeah. on we'll just throw them up no problem just you know this camera's heavy that was a lot of work but i think it's uh, i think it, it's 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 going to be more functional and uh, we've got some big plans for the front of it and uh well the sides and stuff like that we're gonna make this thing look look like a million bucks it's actually made of plywood so it actually is not far off of a million dollars i think you got some there we go okay actually you know what that's good Plan B on the A-frame is the uh, sticks we're going to use to push up the top because I realized that we're going to run on a ladder before we run out of A-frame. Well, that's tall. <laughs> I might have over underestimated the height of this thing. Overestimated the height. I don't know. It's tall. That's tall. Look at how tall that is. Whew. Chapel's almost done. Three more to go. That was a heavy one. So we should be right on par with the uh, the light light one should be that should be a cakewalk on the light one should be just a cakewalk that's cool it's cr that's crazy tall how hard can it be just three more times quarter done we're quarter done oh 
all you now. Okay, come back. Come up. Three up, one to go. But this one has a unique problem is that we've got nothing to stand it up on. So we're gonna do it completely different than the other three. My plan is to stand up the one leg completely where it's gonna go. And then we will both lift the other leg up. And I think, I think it'll work. What do you think, Don? You think so? I think so. You think that's a good plan? It's as good as any we have right now, so. That's right. Just get her done, get her up there. We got all sorts of different problems once we got everything up because this thing is really tall. Maybe taller than I thought it was going to be. So let's get this up and move on to the next problem. Only solutions here, only solutions. I acquired these garage door panels from a buddy of mine. He is a garage door installer and he had a job where he was replacing five garage doors on an old fire hall that uh, I guess was upgrading their glass. And uh, my original plan for these glass panels were to actually make a greenhouse for with them but instead I, uh, I determined well they have the UV tint on them which protect like keeps out all the UV so I can't I couldn't in good faith use them for a greenhouse because it wouldn't allow my plants to grow so instead what I've done is I've I, I thought of a plan to use them for my A-frame. Normally these, these, these glass panels would be stacked on top of each other like a garage door. So they, they're kind of like a tongue and groove system, which one panel sits on top of the other panel and they create a watertight seal. Now that we have the first panel up, I'm gonna secure it to the actual frame of the, the building with these. These are Simpsons strong tie structural screws. They got a little hex head on them and there happens to be a hole directly through the panel already. I'm not sure what that was for, but I'm gonna use it to secure right through the panel and then I'll put some silicone on the screw to prevent it from leaking in the future. You the inspector? Are the inspector coming? Yeah, Batman. Na -na 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 -na. You got my bat Batman collar on. Oh. I figure it's already here, I might as well use it. There's a stiffener on the door and I drilled four holes in it and I added lag screws to the bottom to support my first panel. These glass panels are extremely heavy. They gotta weigh about 150 pounds a piece. In order to get them up, what we did was we brought them to the base of the ladder and then slowly shimmied them up one side at a time, Don on one side, me on the other, until we got them into place. And then we locked them in together with structural screws and silicone at the joint. My figuring on this joint is if I hold them apart and inject silicone, it's polyurethane caulking inside the crack and then I squish both panels together that impregnates the uh, polyurethane caulking inside the crack preventing it from leaking forever. It's the same stuff they put eave trough together or they should use to put eave trough together and that usually lasts well like it's 25 year 50 year caulking so that's that's the plan there uh, and I'm not certain these windows aren't going to leak but if they do I'm going to go around each and every pane with the exact same stuff to seal it up nice and tight. Working off the existing panel, we were able to actually add the additional panel on top and then we drilled two screws in the middle braces in order to attach more screws. And then we screw directly through the panel on either end with uh, structural screws in order to hold them in place. And then once we, get, I'm gonna get, once we get up to the top, we're gonna add a big old ridge cap. What do you think, Don? I think this is gonna go smoothly? Let's hope. So far, so good? So far, so good. Let's hope the uh, next two goes I find if you if you if you treat it like like sort of like a turtle race, right? You kind of slow and steady. I think if you kind of rush it, you run into problems really fast. But if you go slow and think it out, you kind of foresee the problems before you got a panel kind of half up in the sky and you don't know what to do because it's going to break or something like that. So So I just noticed we've got a little bit of the lag bolt ends coming out of the top and I don't want them to get in the road of the panel. So what we're gonna do is we got an angle grinder. We're just gonna zip those things off. There's a couple little bits off of two of them. 
So grind those guys off so they're not in the road. And then we can carry on with the last panel. Is the last panel lighter, Don? No. Well, I'm sitting at the top of the A-frame. This is possibly the most uncomfortable spot to sit there is. Bottom to the top of this thing is roughly 13 foot 4 inches, right at the top. And that's from the floor all the way to the top, and then we're a couple feet up. A little point, and what it does is it sits on the cap, just like that. So it's a perfect, it's a perfect fit. And then what I'm going to do is actually take this to my fabricator and tell them this is exactly what I want. There's, there's no real guesswork involved. It shows exactly the angle, the exact distance, the exact everything. And then you can just duplicate it. Because what I'm going to do is make a hat to sit on top of the ridge. We're going to try to fill in the inside. So the front wall, the back wall, do our front cladding and all that sort of good stuff. We, I, I've been kind of hemming and hawing on exactly what to do. I haven't quite yet decided. I'm just gonna start building. I think that's the only way to start get this thing. Maybe it'll come to me as I, as I build. I've got uh, I got Don here. He's uh, he's just stripping some of these windows. We got some more windows that we took out of a job, and probably about a year ago now. And they've been sitting sitting out back, and they're uh, they're crank out windows, and they're they're held together in the middle with little cleats, so you can break them apart, and then gives you two windows. So we'll have four windows to work with. We also have this really really long guy. I feel like I should inform you that the sun has come out. It feels like it's the first time the sun has come out in four or five days. It's been obscenely dreary around here. Dreary! It's gonna be spectacular when the sun actually does come out. As you can see, we're moving right along on our walls. It's uh, kind of a pain to stick frame a giant triangle. Uh, we've got our wood in place mostly. We just gotta fill in a couple of the top parts and uh, then we're gonna have a window frame. We've got, uh, we've decided to do uprights on our windows so we don't have to uh you know do it on an angle or anything like that and then we're going to try to incorporate or keep some of the structural framing in the final of the build and then we've got our fireplace which is going to go right in the middle of those both windows i think it'll give us a nice little focal point i think it'll be cool all right we got the back done as you can see we got our plywood up we got our windows in we're moving right along. We got quite a bit done today. We haven't quite decided what we're going to do for finishing on this plywood. It might just get like a solid stain or something like that just for now, just to keep the weather off of it because uh, winter's coming and uh, we want to get it done. But we're going to focus on the front and the sides because uh, that's our primary objective. After much debate whether or not I should just build a door or if I have something laying around or if I could, you know, reuse something, I ended up finding myself a old patio door. So a sliding glass door. Uh, one of them was fogged and the other one was just laying around so I figured I would uh, hinge it. So I'm going to hinge it here. I've got the door frame built out and uh, so I did built that on the floor and then stood it up and then what I'm going to do is actually take the door and insert it in here because I wanted to preserve the front structure of the cabin in order to kind of showcase it because you can see you can see the timber frame construction so I wanted to be able to see that when everything is said and done. So that's why it kind of builds in towards the cabin. All right guys, now that we have all our our sheeting up on the outside, I want to cut some holes in it. Now, it is predominantly made of glass, but I think I should add some more glass. So my door is going to be glass. I tried to make some of my windows that I had fit in these uh, side places over here and over here. They don't quite fit. It turns out you don't have that much room in a triangle. So what I'm going to do is above the door, I was going to add a little detail and it's this guy right here. This is the very dirty, you got to wash it. They're all, you know, they store them in the back. It's actually really cool as you talk into it and really amplifies the sound. It's kind of cool because it's a big, it's kind of a dome. Anyway, so this is going to go 
above the door at some point. I think I gotta, I gotta center it above the door, cut it out, and then that gives me pretty much all the openings that I need in this place. It'll add a little uh, je ne sais quoi, you know, a little bit of detail, because it's all about making it look good, I think, because I like circles. <laughs> Once I got the circle all cut out, all I had to do was cut a bunch of blocks, two by four blocks, just the thickness of my wall, and I actually skirted all the way around the circle in order to give myself structure from when I'm finishing on the inside, something to nail to. It's not like the first time I've done the circle, but everyone's unique. Details, details, it's all in the details, just bringing you guys up to speed on this little detail. This is the little window ledge here. It's not, not a window ledge. It looks like a window ledge, but it's not. It's kind of like a, it's a ledge where my cladding is going to sit on top, and what I do when I put these guys on is I always make sure they're a little bit slanted so the water runs off. So if the water comes in in this direction, it's here, runs down here, and then drips off here without causing any damage to stuff below that. I got both sides all done. Now all I've got to do is wait for my little cookies because we're going to do the uh, modified cordwood front. And that's the next, that's the next step. Holy oh, yeah. hell, door's here. My original plan was to have some sort of fascia made up, bent up for the front, but uh, that didn't quite pan out the way I wanted it to. We had some material issues, so instead what I did was I actually had a, some of the old garage door panels. What I ended up doing is taking this chunk off of a panel that was unused, and uh, what I was able to do is actually cut an angle peak edge there and put some mending plates on the front of it and then attach it. And I think it looks pretty darn good. Kind of looks like a stealth bomber now. You ever trust the weatherman on something and he's Dead wrong? Well, he's dead wrong today. It was supposed to be a rain delay. That's why I kind of tell Don, we might as well just, you know, lay low and uh, I'll just do some inside stuff. As it turns out, it's not raining. I ended up gluing a little strip in there in order to accommodate the space for the hinges. Otherwise, there's like a little groove. There's a little groove at the top. The top of the door is okay, but the, uh, the side of the door where I'm gonna put my hinges, I don't want a groove there. So I put a piece of wood in there. I put some PL Premium in there to hold her in. I'm not exactly certain that the door is going to hold up over time. It's not designed to be hung from hinges. I'm going to put three hinges on to give it a little bit more extra support. And uh, if all those fails in the future, if it does fail, I will uh, just build another door. So I've got three of these guys and they're going to be all three of them on the door. And then because my hinge is square, I use an exacto knife to trim my edges because my router bit is round. Well, it doesn't always work that easy, but this one worked really, really well. It seems to fit in there really good. My opening's nice and square. Well, how's that for a really fancy window? So I had my buddy, Dennis, weld up a, uh, a frame for that thing and gave it to me in a rough state and I grinded it out and ended up painting it and ended up gluing my, or siliconing my glass eyeball window to the front of it. I think that looks crazy cool. That looks, that looks really neat. What do you think, Don? Isn't it cool looking? That looks great. It's actually, it's neat because it actually reflects the sun. It reflects the, the, the horizon. You can kind of see it in, in the window. It's That's really cool. Well guys, that took an absurd amount of time. I think real time was like three hours. It kind of hurts. It looks cool. It looks really cool. Doesn't that look neat? That looks that looks really cool. What do you think, Don? Look at that. I like it. Doesn't it look like a, a pretty big game of Plinko? Maybe we should drop some, uh, some what do they drop down the Plinko game? Marble? Is it a ball or a marble or something? Ball I, bearing or something? It's a, maybe a ball bearing. We should just drop it from the top and see where it lands. All right, so here's the plan. We're gonna take this cookie, I'm gonna to toss it up in the air like a T-ball. I'm gonna, Don is gonna cork a couple of them. 
You think? Try. Aim, aim that way. Okay. Ready? Oh, we got one. Oh, oh. Foul ball. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the plan now is to take our milled siding. We're gonna do board and batten siding. And this is gonna go in the front. We're gonna do it up and down, we'll do it vertically. And then before we're gonna do that, we're gonna actually attach some uh, tar paper to further waterproof the front. And uh, my plan at some point is to actually make the wood turn gray so it matches everything else. We started off with the board and batten at the front of the building. We started right in the middle of the door and we attached our boards and we went all the way across ensuring they were level, cut around the door and then cut the piece to size near the end of the uh, building. And then what we did was we added the battens and we sure to level those or plumb them in order to make it appear straight. And then after that was done, we just nailed them off extra well and uh, we're done. Our next step is to do the ridge cap. I had my buddy Dennis bend up some metal. We're gonna install it on the ridge. My original plan was to get a uh, seamless piece one front to back, we couldn't find that stuff. So we ended up actually taking the bottom sections of the garage door had an aluminum panel on and we took that and we bent it in half to make ridge caps. So we've got four of them and we're gonna lay them like shingles along the ridge. But first, there's a limited opportunity, a limited window of opportunity to actually get this stuff caulked. So it's kind of a pain, but uh, I think I'm gonna have to do every single one of these windows. Um, there was supposed to be, I guess the spec on them was supposed to be some sort of glazing in between, like a waterproof glazing. But what I was finding when it was raining was the actual water was pooling down only at the sides of the mullion. So what I'm doing is I'll caulk both sides of these guys, let it dry and then caulk the tops and the bottoms the next day. But uh, that should keep us the water out of it. And uh, you just kind of wait for it to rain and then you go check it again and see if uh, you need to put more caulking in. Because hey, it is what it is, right? It's a glass building. I think it's a pretty cool hat. This is the chimney cap. It's custom bent to the proper size of the ridge cap. And that's going to, uh, let me take this off my head. I feel like Don Quixote or something like that. From Lord of La Mancha. So that's that's it there. I can, uh, it looks like armor. Somebody would wear that to battle in the middle ages. It's uh, made out of aluminum. It's all bent. It's got the uh, nice slope on the top to shed water. And that is going to go on my ridge cap in order to allow my chimney to go through it. You can see I've already got the thing marked out. So I'll just go on the top. So the plan is to blow off all the existing water that's there, give it the afternoon to dry out, and then I can come around and caulk the other sides of them. Come hell or high water, I'm gonna make this thing stop leaking. So like I was saying before, what I've done is I've actually caulked all three sides. So this side, the bottom side, and the upside, or the other side. I haven't caulked this top corner yet because I figured everything would just kind of sheet down and then just keep carrying on out. But what's occurring is it's actually going this way and then that way and then back around and it's coming out <clears throat> the side. Well, some of it's coming out the side, but some of it's going down this channel and out the side, like through the bolts that are attaching the panel together. So I think if I do the top side, I will be able to get the, uh, the leaking under control. So this is what I've got, RTV silicone. It's uh, like bulletproof sort of stuff. It's uh, Industrial, industrial and construction. What does that mean? So I, what I did was I took a bunch of um, cedar trees that we had laying around here, the shorties and the not so thick ones, and I just made a flat edge on them. And that's what's gonna be my joists on the front part of the cabin. And uh, yeah, that should work out good. 113, three quarters. There are many different ways to build a deck. In this deck in particular, what I did was I started by cutting my ledger board the width of the cabin, then I fastened it onto the front, and then I proceeded to add joists on each side, and then I used a small stick in order to level them, and then I added the front board. Traditionally, when you would be building a deck, you'd be using pressure-treated lumber. And what that is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a spruce that they inject all sorts of crazy chemicals in it and it lasts for uh, many, many years, 20, 30 years. I'm opting instead for a more natural product, which is cedar. Cedar has natural oils in it that lasts a really long time. Anytime you build a uh, you know cedar fence or a cedar deck, it uh, 
it weathers and it, uh, it's bug resistant, rot resistant, water resistant, moisture resistant, resistant to pretty much everything. And it's got that nice gray patina when it's done, when it's weathered. That's what I like about it. So this is what I have, this is what I'm gonna use. And uh, I think it's gonna turn out great. Now, normally what you would do is you'd set your posts below the frost line. And here in Canada, you wanna go down at least four feet. But in this case, because my deck isn't that far off the ground, what I opted for instead was to put a couple of patio pavers down, kind of like little feet. When it's attached to the actual cabin, it'll kind of, it'll stay on the cabin and then float at the front. I don't imagine it's going to heave that much in the forest. The frost level doesn't go that deep in the forest, so I didn't feel it necessary to actually dig holes this time. We'll see it, which ones last longer, whether or not the posts in the ground or the posts on patio papers. I nailed my post temporarily on both corners and then notched out the middle post in order to give it a little bit more support. At a later date, I'm gonna add lag bolts through the structure in order to attach it to the, uh, to the post themselves. Ideally, when you're framing a deck, you're using galvanized nails in order for them to, or prevent them from rusting. And once my posts are set, what I do is I actually use my chainsaw and cut them off level to the underside of the deck. Once the basic structure of the deck was completed, I used my tape measure in order to ensure it was square. So if you measure from one corner to the other, and then from the one corner to the other, you could determine if it's square. If those numbers match up, that means you're square. And you could adjust it incrementally until it is. Well guys, I think we're onto something here. We've used what otherwise would be scrap wood and we've flattened the one side and we've used them for joists. And as you can see, they're like five or six times the width of joists. And they're a piece of wood that traditionally would be discarded or mulched up. And did I mention they're cedar? So these guys, these joists, in my opinion, will probably last forever because they're up high and dry and, and they're gonna be covered and protected. Obviously, this is not something you can do at your house due to uh, building codes, perhaps, for like a cabin in the forest or something like that. It's a viable solution, uh, you know, not having joists or even spending the time to, to mill up. There's a lot of waste whenever you use a sawmill, but with this one, there's like, there's like no waste. There's, you know, you've got one scab and then you got a, you know, a joist this way. You could do it even longer if you wanted to. I think it looks pretty good. What do you think? I think it's, it's great. The only thing we need is a step. And I got Don, he's going to the upper side where there is uh, the rocks. Same place where I got the rock for the uh, sauna. There's some big rocks there. We needed like a 12 inch thick rock by about three feet wide. I don't know if we'll be able to carry that, but we're gonna give it a whirl. He's, he's just on the hunt right now. I'm just gonna mention that uh, we got our EcoFlow Delta out here and we uh, running our compressor for our nail gun. And uh, we started off at 99% battery and we're at 88%. So that actually worked pretty darn good. Um, if you had to lug a you know a gas powered generator over here and have that thing running and making noise and whatnot, it would have just been a drag. We selected a couple of rocks. Don's just gonna grab them, he's gonna bring them by. They may or may not work, we're gonna try them out. One's got a flat surface and then a round bottom, so we're thinking maybe digging it in a little bit, the round part, and then seeing if we can make it flat on the top. But we can't find a rock that's big enough to do it just with one single rock, so we're gonna probably use two rocks. That'll give us the front, hopefully, that we need. Otherwise, I've put, uh, I put some feelers out to some, some buddies that are nearby to see Maybe they got a nice flat rock. We'll see, we can always change it out. Have them ornamental rocks if they just don't work and uh, go from there. You gotta use what you got, right? Well guys, I found the deal of the century. I was at the local hardware store and uh, turns out end of season sales are on now. Nobody buys uh, Adirondack chairs or Muskoka chairs in the fall. I guess they're just waiting for winter, but uh, lucky for me, they're on sale for a really good deal. There's even a cup holder. Look at that. They had, uh, they had bigger ones for 350 pound ones. So ultimately I've been waiting for the rain to come. Today was supposed to rain. It looks very, it's, it's overcast. And I don't want to finish the inside without knowing it's watertight. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping for rain. <laughs> it's the last time, usually I'm hoping for no rain. Sure. Crafted. All right, so we started by adding some blocking to the wall. And what 
what we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually put in our vertical board and batten and siding. And so Don's just cutting up some of these uh, these board and battens and once those guys are up, we're gonna, we're gonna put it on and we're gonna do it kind of in stages. You're probably wondering, where is the insulation, Kevin? Well, the insulation is outside. I bought it and I was gonna install it and then I thought to myself, this really no use to put insulation in. And if this thing gets wet and if there's condensation forming, it gets into the walls and it gets into the insulation, it's going to retain moisture. What I'd rather it to do is if it gets wet, it has the ability to dry out. And if anytime you put insulation and it gets wet, it has a really hard time drying out. So that's why I'm not putting insulation in this thing. And really, if I were to put insulation in, I would get R14 in the very little wall I have. This is majority glass, which has an R value of uh, nothing or one. It's the middle between zero and one. I'm gonna be working more so on air sealing than anything else in this build. So like, if you've ever seen those guys that are putting up brick, they uh, they put themselves almost like a tarp bubble and then they can heat it because it's air sealed. So that's the plan with this thing is to get it air sealed, which allow me to retain my heat from my wood stove to give it a nice comfortable space. But the insulation is not going to provide very much value and it can only hinder this progress. When I was thinking of the interior cladding on the A-frame, I thought that I want to use something thin enough that it's easier to work with. I was using large panels like plywood or something and then trying to go around windows and stove pipes and whatnot, it would have been difficult. So what I actually chose to do was go thin pieces of board and batten uh, in order to install it. So what I did with this particular install is I actually started from the middle and worked my way out to the edge. And the reason I did that is because once I get to the edge, I can actually use the board beside it as a measuring point because otherwise you're kind of starting in the middle of nowhere and uh, trying to figure out your angle. But once you've figured out the first angle, generally you can use that piece for the following piece and use it as a template in order to cut your other piece. So you slowly kind of methodically work your way up to the, uh, to the peak and get your pieces installed. And it's also easier to do breaks. So if you don't have to do a full length floor to ceiling piece, it's always easier. So you do a horizontal break in the middle of it and it kind of gives it a little bit more of a detailed finish uh, and it's also easier to install. So that's kind of what I did here and uh, it seemed to work out really well. All right guys, I'm gonna introduce you to the Cubic Mini Stove. This is the Cubic Mini Stove, but it's the Grizzly version of it, which is the slightly larger version of the Cubic Mini Stove. The last couple of videos I uh, on my builds on the Cube and in the Glamper, we've installed the Cub, which is the smaller version of this again. This is the biggest they make, but it's still very mini, which is really cool. Now that we have our back wall finished, we're gonna put our stove mount in. This is the Cubic Mini Stove Grizzly Wall Mount Kit. It's a stainless steel piece that's bent up really nice. So the idea behind the stainless steel is that it uh, provides you sort of a heat shield against any combustible surfaces. And that's how you can mount your stove right on the wall. A lot of larger stoves require a tremendous amount of clearance. So that's why these stoves are ideal for tiny spaces such as, such as this. There you go, wall bracket. So when my stove is ready, we just set it in place. It's got little grooves here. We set her down in here, and we're all ready to go. I've got my heat shield up along. I got two sections of it up. Hey Don, it's snowing. Yeah, snowing, did you call for this snow? It is November, um, so. Snowing on the QE, it's not even, it's just kind of evaporating. Sublimation, it goes from a solid to nothing. So the, uh, the plan with this stuff is to uh, well, first start with your first row and then you face nail it because you can't get the nailing gun close enough to the, uh, to the wall in order to hit it with the proper. So you face nail that guy and then you toe, toe nail it and uh, yeah, you carry on and then you just work your way across the floor just like that. Easy as that. You guys are probably wondering why I'm putting cherry hardwood floors in here. Well, we did a job a couple years ago and uh, the whole main floor of the house was installed with this beautiful cherry floor and it was scheduled to actually be removed 
Uh, and the primary reason why was because the tongues and the grooves aren't on the end. So uh, that's why we ended up getting it. And uh, like I said, it was destined for the landfill. Instead, uh, I ended up denailing it and storing it. I had a whole pile of it. So I, I ended up using it in the outdoor workshop and uh, I probably have enough to do this cabin, which is really cool. I'm not so particular with the uh, not having the ends, having the tongue in the groove. And those are, those are designed so they don't, they don't pop up. But uh, in a cabin, you're not so concerned. In your house, when you're trying to do the old uh, Tom Cruise slide with your sock feet on the floor, not so good. Cabin, not so bad. But the star of this show is the, the EcoFlow Delta, because that uh, we started off with 100% battery on this floor, and uh, we're down to 90%. Ran the compressor, and the compressor ran the nail gun, and uh, we were able to nail this entire floor off 10% of that battery, which is exceptional, because as you guys know, the compressor does draw a lot of juice. It's like 1,200 watts when it's running. And it peaks, so that was really cool. There's nothing like doing a little bit of hardwood floors to remind you how old you are. We ended up using this more of the board and battens at the top of the cathedral. And uh, well, all we gotta do is put the battens, but we uh, got that installed. Actually, I think it looks, I think it looks crazy. It looks amazing. Look at that. We just gotta put some battens in, but first we gotta put our trim on. So we got our trim around our doors. Now we got our baseboard. So what we've done is we repurposed the, uh, the hardwood floor and we've ripped it into, uh, strips so this is going to be our baseboard we ended up uh well i ended up going a little shopping for some lights last night and uh, as it turns out it's more difficult to find what's inside my head at the store than uh than you'd believe so my plan was to originally get some kind of like a two lake fixture um kind of like a wall sconce that shines up and shines down um i couldn't find those originally i saw them at costco at one point and uh anything you see at costco if you don't buy it right away you'll never find it again so this is our trim this is old mahogany it's been painted white and uh, we're gonna reuse it because it's it's still good stuff. It's very it's got a few knots and it's it's ideal trim when it uh, when it was brand new. But this stuff's probably about forty or fifty years old. It's got a little smell to it. What is it, what does it smell like, Don? It smells like perfume. It smells like a little like old lady. Like a, yeah, like a uh, like an old lady perfume. Yeah, like it's, your, it's weird. Like your grandmother or aunt. Yeah. Perhaps. Wow. It's definitely got a smell to it. When installing window casing, I find the easiest way to do it is actually to take your trim and cut it a little bit longer than you need it to be. And then take that piece, set it alongside the window and mark your uh, your 45s where they start. You wanna leave yourself a little bit of reveal because that gives you a little bit of style once you're done. And then once you've cut your 45, you just do a test fit. And if you've got to adjust it that way, you just cut a little bit more on it. The, one of the problems I found with the casing installation on the A-frame in particular was it was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. The, uh, the windows were butted directly up against the actual structure of the frame so you kind of had to do a little bit of a trial and error in order to get it to fit properly and the wood stove was tight against that as well. So you kind of had two 45s and then one ended up you know butting up to nothing. So yeah once you got your trial and error you kind of cut a little bit off. You always want to cut it a little bit at a time in order to see if it's going to fit or not but uh, otherwise it's uh, just a little bit of a little bit of tediousness and you get her done. Nothing more satisfying than a nice miter joint. True. So when you put the boards up, it's not super critical you make them plumb. And the reason why is because afterwards you could straighten them out. So like, it's not a bad idea to put them plumb, but if you don't get them perfectly plumb, and in this case we didn't get them perfectly plumb, what you would do is you would take your laser and you shoot a straight line. And what that allows you to do is put your battens on and it gives the illusion of all your boards being plumbed. I've got a really wide piece. This is my sacrificial piece I'm gonna use as a template. And what I'm gonna do is actually cut out the bottom of the jam because I wanna be able to slide my threshold piece underneath the jam. When I picked a board for a threshold, I made sure the cupping was cupping upwards so the water drains off the front of it because I don't want any water sitting on the sill. And then I'm gonna further waterproof it by actually caulking the edges of this guy. So we're moving right along here. We've got all our little window sills. I don't even think they're sills, they're just sills. We've got the sill plates all cut out. Those were kind of like a pain in the butt because you had to cut around these little the beams. So they're nicely, they're nice and sitting. We've got both sides all done. I figure we should celebrate that accomplishment by having coffee. It's coffee time. Don and I are gonna we're gonna try the uh, with the EcoFlow and a kettle because uh, that's the ultimate test on a, on a especially on a power pack is to run a kettle. So I got my French press here. So Don's gonna Don, we're gonna set that up. 
Oh, she's ramping up. 14, 1500 watts. We can hear the inverter kicking on. This is like the ultimate test of any pack, whether it can run a kettle. 1400, 1500. Oh, coffee. You guys are gonna probably wonder why the heck we got a futon in the forest. Well, there's a good story behind this thing. I found it. I was, I was going to get furniture and I found it. There was like, I actually talked to the people so they didn't have bed bugs or anything. It wasn't like a random futon on the side of the road. I, they had just put it out and they're like, yeah, it, we just don't have any room for it. And they said, yeah, you can have it. So what's good about this is it's not leather, it's vinyl. And if you guys ever had a leather anything in the forest, the moisture tends to uh, make the leather turn into a uh, moldy uh, mold fest. So you don't want to have like leather gloves Anything that's kind of got that moisture in it, they start to grow. So you want vinyl furniture if you're going to have kind of anything, anything off grid that you're not going to heat all of the time that gets a little bit of moisture in it. That's the, uh, that's the plan. So anyways, cheers to that. Well, we sat down far too long. You know, you kind of get it away on you. It's like, enjoy the day, right? The winter's coming. It's going to get snowy really, really soon. So might as well just enjoy the time when we get the nice weather. Ta-da! We got light. Oh, that's pretty nice. So what we got there is the EcoFlow pack power in the entire cabin now. We've got uh, receptacles on all the walls. So that uh, the way there is we hook it up directly into there. So that's a double-ended cord. Switches. Ooh, lights. Actually, I like that. I like that a lot. That's pretty cool. Just enough light, I think. We don't want to light the ceiling up. This is actually really cool. What do you think, Don? Very nice. Isn't that cool? Yeah, I really like it. it. It's just enough light. It's not too bright, and it's it's still daylight out, so it's not it's not extra extra bright. Well, I couldn't pass those guys up. I was at my uh, local junk store, and I guess they get some uh, returns from Home Depot every once in a while. And those are patio lanterns, and I think they're cool. They're nice and they got the ambiance. So when there's the stars aren't out and you want your inside stars on, you just turn the switch. You got the switch, turn them on, turn them off, turn them on, turn them off. That's pretty neat. It's got that nice warm glow. So when you want, you know, they got the crackling fire and then you look up and you see the nice twinkly Looks like the little Edison bulbs, which are the, uh, but those are actually uh, low voltage LED bulbs. They're two watts a piece. So I don't know, he can do the math on that guy. It's not too, that's not terrible, but it's pretty cool. It's inside tour time. The inside of the A-frame is done. Let's take you on a little bit of a tour. I, uh, I just finished it up just in time. The rain has started. We've got, uh, we got everything buttoned up. I always like to do like inside stuff when it's raining. So today's like a perfect day, that sort of thing. So come on in. The weather's nice. It's actually quite, it's quite appealing in here. I think, I, I like it, I like it a lot. This thing is made out of old garage doors and the garage doors came from an old fire hall that was upgrading their doors and they had these guys left over. I said, hey, I want them. I wanna make something really cool with them. That's what this whole thing is primarily made of, that and uh, some kind of homemade uh, everything else. Some cherry hardwood floors that was reclaimed from a job. So that was uh, salvaged. It could have been going to the landfill, but it's not. We've got, uh, this whole cabin is being powered by the EcoFlow Delta. We've got uh, dual packs, so they're parallel together, so it gives us twice the amount of power. Uh, and that's what's powering the lights and the plugs and everything else in here. It, uh, it can power, it powers our little coffee station. And uh, if you wanna have a little cooktop, electric cooktop, induction range or anything like that, you can power these guys with the EcoFlow Delta. They can either be charged by line voltage, by bringing them to your house and charging them. They can either be charged by uh, solar, uh, or you can charge them with your car. There's many options to charge these guys. So that's the EcoFlow Delta, that's what's charging these things. This little table here, this is a good story for this. Actually, I was out on uh, on Halloween, October 31st, and uh, anyways, it was on the side of the road, it said free on it, so I took it. I think it's a piece of uh, uh, you know, patio furniture. I think I think it's teak, actually. Maybe one day I will actually strip it, So because I don't like the brown, but uh, hey, you know what? It works really well as a table. I got some chairs, again, that's another road find, and uh, got a little poof some decorations. And uh, this is what's heating this place is the uh, mini cubic wood stove. This is the grizzly version of this thing. It is really cool because it takes really, 
early little wood. So this is a uh, little branch wood. I've got it all cut and split. It's uh, dry and uh, this thing, this thing's a little powerhouse. It's, uh, it's designed for tiny homes. It can, uh, you know, you could, you could heat your, your tiny home, your RV, your boat, your schoolie. They got little, you know, those little tiny homes on wheels. It's cool because you can actually use the top to cook stuff on or to warm your coffee or whatnot. It's got like, uh, it's got all the features of, of a full-size wood stove, but it's just tiny. It's got the little tiny dampers at the front and it's got the little tiny dampers at the back. So what that does is once you've loaded your wood, you can actually introduce fresh air into the front of the fire or you can introduce fresh air into the back of the fire so it gives you more of an even burn or you can dampen them both down and get a really long burn. It's also cool about these things is they've got little uh, little tools because you've got a little fireplace, you want a little tool, a little scoop, towel hooks, coat hooks, whatever have you. We have the lamp. This is the famous lamp from the tarp shelter. There's a video on that thing and I thought uh, we we're going to repurpose the tarp cabin so I figured I'd take the light to its final the lamp with the lampshade to its final kind of destination. We've got uh, an end table or a uh, bedside table made out of a chunk of ash and uh, what I think is a, uh, a frame for a drum. I don't exactly know what it is, but it was cool. It was round. I took it and that's what it is. So yeah, anyways, light goes on and off. It's got a little switch right here. So if you're getting into bed and you want to, you know, turn your lights off right at the last moment, you can. And uh, yeah, so we got our futon. It doubles as a couch. We can crank this thing up and be nice. You relax on our couch if we're not ready for sleeping. And then you can just, you know, crank it down. Crank it down. You got the bed. The old school looks like tungsten bulb. Those, uh, the story on those, those are actual LED bulbs. They've got two watts of power per bulb. So there's about 40 watts up there. So it uses very little power. And uh, the idea behind putting them up there is because it's not always clear. So when you can't stare at the stars, it's stuff I've kind of saved over the years. And I thought, well, this is really cool stuff. I can't let it go to the landfill. So I want to save it. So um, yeah, I'm going to use it. And then one last thing, my round window. I really like the way that turned out with the aluminum kind of jam. That was the old panel from the uh, garage door that I had bent up. It gives us kind of a build out. Wall cladding was uh, some ash tree that we milled out into half inch thick and we did a board and batten style. So you got the boards and the battens and I really like the way that turned out. I really like the way the whole thing turned out. It's, it's, it's really nice in here. I don't know if I can adequately show it with the camera, but it's really cool. First, I think I want some power. I'm gonna do the old EcoFlow Delta two pack. I've got the first pack, it's going to feed the second pack. And this is, allows you to parallel them up together and uh, have double the amount of power. So what you do is you take your connection. This is the charge cord for the line voltage power. Pulling power from this one, it's gonna feed this one. And then I plug my stuff into this one. So what this is doing right now is kind of sort of balancing the pack. So this is our feed pack. So this is this is what everything's plugged into, and this is feeding that pack. So what it's doing right now is this pack's actually charging this pack. So we got 700 watts going out of that pack into this pack. So once this pack gets to 100%, this one will turn off and then slowly kind of feed its juice back into that one until this one's completely depleted and then uses this one. So that's how you hook them up in parallel and not have to switch packs kind of midway through. So this is kind of ideal situation if you want, you know, do you want a long weekend sort of thing and you need uh, double the amount of power or uh, yeah, you just, you know, want to make sure you have enough. Okay, now that we got our heat shield up, we're gonna put our little, uh, actually we have to cut our hole in our little hat. And this is the, this is going to be the roof flashing that's gonna sit on our peak. I had uh, Dennis make this up, my ever faithful welder dude. He used the uh, piece of the paneling, the bottom section, and he bent up the aluminum. This stuff's proving to be very, very versatile stuff. You can pretty much make anything with it uh, if you've got the, uh, the talent to do it. So that's, uh, that's the roof hat. I just gotta drill a pilot hole in the top and uh, nothing like a nice sharp bit. Pile hole! And then, should be able to tinsel it. Oh! So that's where my roof pipes kind of go through. Now that I got my hole cut on my roof, it should be as easy as sliding the pipe in from the inside. Have it all kind of connected and just pop it right through and then I'll put my cap back on. Silicone it all up and it should be good. 
Got my roof boot on just in time. It started to rain a little bit. I don't think it's gonna hold up, but uh, I can't silicone when everything's soaking wet. So I'm gonna try to, I'm just gonna light a fire and see if uh, the warmth will dry up this, this aluminum in order to allow me to actually silicone this today. She's a burning. Chimney, chimney's going. You see that? Smoking. Well, I've got all homegrown stuff on this grill. I've got, um, I've got potatoes that I planted myself in the spring. I've got pork that I raised myself. And my vegetable is carrots, which I also raised myself in my garden. I'm really not good at cooking on an open fire. But anyways, I'm gonna give it my, the old college try. Looks cooked, right? That's that's what I asked my wife. Is it cooked? Is it cooked? Well, I was just finishing up dinner and uh, the skies kind of opened up and we had a deluge of rain again. It was, I had to run around and grab all my stuff, make sure it was all inside. I like building. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys can tell yet that I like building. I like building unique things, interesting things. And if they're not unique, I'll just put my own little spin on them, so. What I like to do is I like to go charcoal. So what you do is you, you put some wood in there and then you let it flame up. And then once all of the wood is charred, you turn it down, you dampen it down, and that makes your heat last the longest. And I have the glow of the fire on the outside. And if you guys are worried about that, it's uh, it's it's wet. Nothing, nothing can possibly catch fire out there. I wonder what the temperature is gonna be in the morning. I'm not sleeping in my underwear tonight. You guys see that? That's as, that's as slow as my camera will go. You can just barely make out that it's, it's light out. I can't show you this guy as well as, as well as I can see it. And if it was clear day, you'd see stars. It's pretty spectacular, actually. It's too bad. It's too bad I can't show it to you. Well, if you stay under the covers and you put your hood up on your sweater, it's not terrible. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's good. It's certainly not a winter cabin because it's made of glass. <laughs> it's really hard to keep warm. I'm gonna enjoy my breakfast. You guys, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one and uh, join me on the next one.